How does Amazon maintain high availability during Black Friday traffic spikes? Why do financial systems rarely lose transactions despite network failures? Today, we'll explore the reliability and consistency concepts that power high-scale distributed system. Let's dive right in. System reliability isn't about preventing all failures. It's about continuing to work correctly when failures inevitably happen. Network partitions will occur. Servers will crash. Hard drives will fail. The question is, how do we build systems that handle these realities gracefully? There are seven key concepts that make this possible. Let's examine each one. The CAP theorem establishes a fundamental constraint. Distributed system can provide at most two of these three guarantees simultaneously. Consistency. All nodes see the same data at the same time. Availability. Every request to a non-failing node receives a response. Partition tolerance. The system continues operating despite network failures. Since network partitions are unavoidable in distributed systems, you are really choosing between consistency and availability during partition events. Let's look at how real systems make this choice. Google Spanner chooses consistency. It uses atomic clocks and synchronized time across global data centers to maintain linearizable transactions. During network partitions, the majority partition remains available for both reads and writes, while minority partitions become read-only. The trade-off is that nodes in the minority partition lose write availability until the partition heals. Amazon DynamoDB chooses availability. During network partitions, it continues accepting writes using eventual consistency and resolve conflicts to last write wins based on timestamps. Users always get responses, but they might occasionally see stale data. Neither approach is right or wrong. It depends on your requirements. Banking systems typically need consistency. Social media feeds can tolerate eventual consistency. Eventual consistency makes a simple promise. If you stop making updates, all replicas will eventually converge to the same state. This might sound sloppy, but it's incredibly powerful for large-scale systems. Here's why. In an eventually consistent system, writes can complete immediately without waiting for confirmation from all replicas. This improves performance and availability. Amazon's shopping cart works this way. You can add items even if some servers are temporarily unreachable. But how does the system handle conflicts when different replicas receive different updates? When conflicts occur, systems use different resolution strategies. Last right wins use timestamp to pick the most recent update. Simple but can lose data. Conflict-free replicated data types use mathematical properties to guarantee that all replicas converge to the same state regardless of update order. Application-defined merge functions let developers write custom logic for resolving conflicts based on business rules. Modern systems like DynamoDB typically achieve consistency within milliseconds under normal conditions, making the eventual part barely noticeable to users. Load balances distribute incoming requests across multiple servers. Sounds simple, but there's sophisticated engineering behind effective load balancing. There are two main types. Layer 4 load balancers operate at the transport layer. They make routing decisions based on IP addresses and TCP UDP ports. They are fast because they don't need to inspect application data, but they are also limited in their routing intelligence. Layer 7 load balancers operate at the application layer. They can examine HTTP headers, URLs, and even request content to make smarter routing decisions. More powerful, but also more computationally expensive. Modern load balancers go beyond simple round-robin distribution. Least connections routing sends new requests to the server handling the fewest active connections. Least time factors in how quickly each server responds, avoiding slower servers. For high availability, Low balances themselves are deployed in primary-secondary configurations with heartbeat protocols. If the primary fails, the secondary takes over within milliseconds. Consistent hashing ensures the same client consistently hits the same server, which is critical for maintaining session state. In our last video, we talked about horizontal scaling. Here's a problem that large horizontally scaled systems face. You have data spread across multiple nodes, and you need to add or remove nodes without moving massive amounts of data. Traditional hashing doesn't work well here. If you use simple modular hashing, then adding one node requires remapping almost all of your data. 
That's expensive and disruptive. Consistent hashing solves this elegantly. Instead of mapping keys directly to nodes, both keys and nodes are placed on a circular hash ring. Here's how it works step by step. First, hash each node to determine its position on the ring. Second, to find where data belongs, hash the key and walk clockwise around the ring until you hit the first node. Third, replicate the data to the next n-1 nodes clockwise on the ring. When you add a new node, it only takes ownership of keys from its immediate neighbors. When you remove a node, its keys get redistributed to the next nodes on the ring. The result? Adding or moving nodes only requires moving k over n keys instead of nearly all keys, where k is total keys and n is the number of nodes. Amazon DynamoDB and Apache Cassandra both use consistent hashing for exactly this reason. It lets them scale horizontally without massive data reorganization. When one service in a distributed system fails, it can trigger a cascade of failures across dependent services. Circuit breakers prevent this. A circuit breaker monitors the failure rate of calls to the dependent service. It has three states, closed, requests float normally, open, requests are blocked immediately, returning fast failures, half open, a few test requests allow through to check if the service has recovered. Here's how it works step by step. The circuit breaker tracks successful and failed requests to a service. When the failure rate exceeds a threshold, the circuit breaker trips to open state. In the open state, requests fail immediately without even attempting to call the failing service. This prevents resource exhaustion and gives the failing service time to recover. After a timeout period, the circuit breaker moves to half open and allows a few test requests through. If the test requests succeed, the circuit breaker closes and normal operation resumes. If they fail, it opens again. Netflix pioneered this pattern with their Hystrix library and is now standard in microservices architectures. The key insight is that fast failures are better than slow failures that consume resources. Rate limiting controls how many requests clients can make within a given time window. It protects systems from overload and abuse. There are several algorithms, each with different characteristics. Token bucket accumulates tokens at a fixed rate, up to a maximum capacity. Each request consumes a token. This allows control bursts while maintaining an average rate. Leaky bucket processes requests at a constant rate, smoothing out traffic spikes. Excess requests are queued or dropped. Fixed window counts requests in discrete time intervals. Simple but prone to boundary effects where clients can double their rate by timing requests around window boundaries. Sliding windows uses a rolling average that smooths out the boundary problems of fixed windows. In distributed systems, rate limiting gets more complex. You can't just count requests on a single server. You need coordination across multiple instances. One solution is Redis-based rate limiters that use Lua script to atomically increment counters and set TTLs. This ensures consistent rate limiting across your entire service cluster. Many systems implement tier rate limiting with different limits for authenticators versus anonymous users and progressively stricter limits as suspicious patterns are detected. You can manage what you can measure. Monitoring provides visibility into system behavior and performance. Modern observability focuses on four key signal types, metrics, time series numerical data like CPU usage, request rate, and error counts, logs, structured records of discrete events with contextual information, traces, end-to-end -end request flows showing how a single request moves through your distributed system, events, Significant occurrences like deployments or configuration changes. The challenge is processing massive amounts of telemetry data. Large-scale systems generate terabytes of monitoring data daily. Effective alerting balances two concerns. You want to catch real problems quickly, but you don't want to be overwhelmed by false alarms. Static thresholds work for stable metrics, but fail when traffic patterns change. Modern systems use statistical anomaly detection that learns normal patterns and alerts on deviations. Composite alerts combine multiple signals to reduce noise. Instead of alerting on high CPU alone, you may alert when CPU is high and error rates are increasing and response times are slow. The goal is service-level objectives, 
that measures user experience. Not every system needs all these patterns. A simple web application serving a few thousand users doesn't need consistent hashing or circuit breakers. The concepts we covered give you the tools to make this trade-off consciously rather than discovering your system's limitation during an outage. Start simple, measure everything, and add complexity only when you have clear evidence you need it. That's how you build systems that scale reliably. If you like our videos, you might like our system design newsletter as well. It covers topics and trends in large-scale system design, trusted by 1 million readers. Subscribe at blog.bybygo.com.